What's up guys, so I just got us some nice components for the brand new PC build we are going today and I'm so super excited because as you can see we have a lot of great stuff and oh! Oh, alright, everything's safe, so let's do this guys. Alright, so on the weekend I was cleaning the office and look what I found there. A lot of different components which do not fit perfectly well together, like we have here an overkill um, power supply, we have here a low-end CPU, we have here a really big GPU which doesn't even fit in the case, it barely fits, and all those things. So if you're interested in the latest Skylake builds for any budget, check out the description, I'll link to some there for almost every budget. And now I want to quickly tell you what components we got here. So we got here an Intel Pentium processor. Yes, Pentium is still a thing, so here also the Skylake version. It's the G4400 and it's clocked uh, the base clock of 3.3 GHz. Now this is a very cheap CPU, I think it's like $60 or something like that. So this is what you're going to use. Then we have here a gaming motherboard from Biostar. It's the H170T, as the name suggests. This is a H170 Intel chipset. The bad thing about this is that overclocking is locked, but I'm not really sure if there's not a modded BIOS or something like that, so I will check it out if you can overclock it. If we, if we can, then there will be an overclocking guide. Then here we have a graphics card from XFX. It's the XFX R9 290X. I got some of them sponsored last year, and I have to say, nice graphics card. I still use it in Crossfire in my main system. Then we got here some fans which I ripped off from my old water cooling. Then here we have thermal compound, really important. Here we have the NTH1 and I use it basically in all my kind of builds. Here we have RAM, it's from Corsair, yeah, very cheap, like 20 bucks. It's a one module, four gigabytes, clocked at 1333 megahertz. We also have here a water cooling set, which I wanted to use in a Skylake build. It's kind of old, but um, I think it's really cheap, also like 50 to 60 bucks. It's the Cooler Master Sidon 120V version 2. We have here a really overkill power supply. Now, usually a power supply is nothing you should save on, but this is also not needed for this system. It's 850 watts, the Dark Power Pro 11 from Be Quiet. Very good power supply. I have a review, you can check it out on my channel. And this is the unit I reviewed like a year ago. And then here we have hard drives. And also I recycled an old MSATA SSD. So I put it in like an MSATA to SATA adapter, which is like $10 on Amazon. Very, very cheap. And yeah, that's basically it. Then the case is the only thing I bought for this build and it's a $30 case, it's from Sharkoon. And I think for the price, you really get a lot. This case looks not too bad. So if you would say somebody that's a 20 or 30 dollar case, then they would say, wow. All right, that's it guys. This is what we're building today. And now let's get started. First, there is a very small risk when building a computer that can crush the most powerful system, static electricity. So make sure to ground yourself from time to time by touching the case with the PSU plugged in and turned off or wearing an anti-static wristband. Do not use wool sockets or rub on a balloon before installing the components and you should be safe. The first component we put in our case should be the power supply, typically located on the rear of the case, usually in the bottom or top corner. It's important that you put it in in the correct way with the fans facing the air intake and outtake. Once it's in, make sure to screw in the screws from the backside. I got a modular power supply, which is less a cable mass, so that's maybe worth it for you too. We are going to prepare the motherboard by installing the CPU, cooler and RAM before fitting it in the case. Place the motherboard on a non-metal surface like the box and get your CPU ready. First, we have to open up the socket. Here on this unit, you have to open it up with the lever attached to the socket. Now once it's open, we can insert the CPU, which may look different depending on what you build. This Intel CPU has no pins. The pins are on the motherboard. There is a triangle on the socket and another one on the CPU, so make sure they match and gently put in your CPU. Do not touch the golden contacts and do not apply force, so this is rule number one. Now close the lever to close the socket. Now let's install the cooler. As always, I recommend to get rid of the stock cooler and buy a good and cheap third-party cooler. A look in the manual of the cooler tells you how to mount it. 
Usually, you need to install a backplate first. On the stock cooler, there is already thermal paste applied. It's necessary to apply it on an aftermarket cooler, usually. So, let's do it! There are many ways on how to do it, and it's like science, so a lot of people say different things, but rule number one, do not apply too much and do not over tighten the screws. A pea-sized amount in the middle will do the job. If there is too much, it will get squeezed out into your socket, which is bad, and in the worst case, it can short your CPU. Now put the heatsink gently with even pressure on the CPU and use the mounting screws to fix that. Don't forget to plug in your fan cable to the CPU fan port. If you have two, check the manual of your motherboard. One here is for the fan, the other one is for the water pump. So now we'll install the RAM. Here again the motherboard manual helps and tells you how to do it. The RAM bar has a notch which is not in the middle, so you can't do it wrong. And there is a plastic nose in the socket too. So you can just put it in one way. Open the socket first by opening up the plastic wings on the sides and then put in the RAM. If you have more RAM modules, just check the manual on how to put them in in which order for dual channel. Usually you put them in the same color slots. Before you put in the motherboard, make sure you attach the I.O. shield to the case. So this little metal plate is something I always forget and I hate it, because then you need to get out the motherboard again, the fans, blah blah blah. So once the I.O. shield is in, check the spacers. Most modern cases have spacers between the back wall and the motherboard, known as standoffs, that are built in permanently. So on some other cases you probably need to screw them in for yourself. But they are really important, otherwise you will short your motherboard. Once the spaces are in place, get in the motherboard and screw it down with the screws provided. Also, if you have a water cooling like me, install your radiator like I did. Depending on your case, depending on your radiator. Also, if not done before, install the fans. Airflow matters. That's why the fans have arrows on the frame indicating the airflow. You want that the air comes in on the front side and gets out on the back, so check that the arrows are pointing in the right direction. Otherwise, the cooling is not efficient. If you have more fans in a big case, there are different strategies on how to achieve a better airflow. Google helps here. Also plug in all the fans from the motherboard to the connectors. And also plug in all the fans to the motherboard fan connectors. Once the motherboard is completely seated in the case, there are a few necessary connections. One is the power cable, a wide two-row cable that fits snugly into a similar looking spot on the board itself. This is a 20 to 28 pin connector and it powers both the motherboard and partly a CPU. However, some motherboards have a second 4 pin or 8 pin connector for the processor, which is located near it. It's also time to do proper cable management here. Route the cable through the holes in the case to the back side so that they are kinda hidden. Anyway, you don't need to do this if you don't mind, but it helps with airflow and maintenance. I really don't care about the cable management since this is a spare PC, so please don't hate, it looks terrible, I know. There are also case plugs and buttons that need to be connected to the motherboard to function properly. A two wide row of pins, the location of which will be noted in your manual, and they run the power and reset button. So also we have their hard drive, activity LED, any USB ports and as well as front audio. Regarding the switches, it usually does not matter if you switch plus and minus, but be sure to check it in the manual. And regarding the USB and audio connectors, you can only get them in one way, so there is one pin locked. For this, once again, please refer to your motherboard manual, sometimes it's also labeled on the board itself. Now let's come to the drives. I think modern units do not need an optical drive, so don't kill me if I'm wrong, uh, but I don't use one here. There are two main hard drive sizes you're likely to encounter, and they all mount and connect differently. Generally, spinning disk data drives are the larger 3.5 inch drives, at least in desktop units, while the newer SSDs have a smaller 2.5 inch form factor. Your case should have at least one slot dedicated to this type of drive. More expensive cases have a toolless installation of the drives, so you don't need screws. But my case is crap and the toolless option does not work well. So I just screwed them down and routed the connectors and cables to the backside. Hard drives require two connections, one for power and one for data. The good news is that they are both L-shaped, so it's hard to plug them in, in the wrong slot, it won't work. The power one comes straight from your PSU and the SATA cable comes from your motherboard and it's the data cable, so please stick to the motherboard's manual on how to connect them, sometimes there are faster SATA ports that you should use. Not every system needs a dedicated GPU, but if you need a dedicated GPU, for instance for gaming, editing, blah blah blah, don't worry, it's easy as pie to install that. 
Modern GPUs take up to two PCI Express slots. It's a long thin connector located on the bottom side of your motherboard below the processor. To seat the card in that slot, you will need to remove a backplate from your case. And once that is removed, slide in your GPU in the slot and screw it down. Big GPUs need external power like this one here. That means you need to connect the 6 or 8 pin connector from your PSU directly to the GPU. Once that is done, check your cable management and the connectors twice. And check all the connections, so I can't say it often again. Also check that the power switch is connected properly. Don't forget to switch on your power supply and all those things. If you have any expansion cards, like a sound card, also don't forget them. And after you've checked everything, connect power, don't forget the switch, connect an HDMI cable or VGA or whatever and the mouse and the keyboard and press the power button. Good luck guys! Alright, so the computer is up and running and everything should be fine. Now, when you power it on for the first time, you have to do some things, so let's check it out. First of all, when you start it, you should hear. And here if all the fans are running, here if there's anything making a strange noise, like your hard drive or whatever. So if all the fans are running, then make sure you connect the keyboard and make sure that you can see some kind of screen on the display. And now I'll show you what you have to do. So the first time when you start your computer, there is no operating system on the computer. So you first of all should go into the BIOS and check all the values if everything is okay here. And after that you can install any operating system you want to. And I will probably make another video on this because um, on this unit I'm going to install a Hackintosh build and I have to do some modding from the basic um, Hackintosh installation so to get everything here running. But um, it should be online next week so stay tuned. Anyway, you can install whatever you want to. You can install Windows, you can install Linux, you can install Hackintosh. But um, on Hackintosh, yeah, there are some kind of hardware limitations. All right, so let's have a closer look inside of the BIOS and let's see um, what things we can check out here. So ladies and gentlemen, um, the PC is up and running and this is how the BIOS looks like. But first of all, when you start your computer, it will look different. So um, actually you will just see a blank screen, probably you will hear a beep from the speaker you have attached. And there you go, then you can see the boot screen and usually if you have connected a blank hard drive it will say reboot and select proper boot device blah blah blah. So now you just um, reboot and now you hit the delete key or F2 or F1 key or whatever what, what it says here on the screen and this will directly bring you into the BIOS, okay? And here you can check out some options, so let's check it out. All right, all right guys, there we go. And as you can see, you can see here a lot of different values. And first of all, here you can see the CPU fan speed. Now, my fans were stuck at maximum. This is because, um, yeah, by default, here the smart fan control, for instance, was set to disabled and then they were spinning at maximum speed, which is very noisy. So if your fans are really loud, then make sure you check out here the smart fan control or fan control in your BIOS. All right, guys, you can see here also several other things. Check out if the CPU is running with the full clock. And here you can also see the temperatures and usually you can also check out some advanced temperatures and I'm not really sure where I can find this here in this BIOS but anyway I'm pretty sure you will find it because as you can see this BIOS has really a lot of things. Yeah, here hardware monitor. Um, 30 degrees here on the CPU which is quite decent and system temperature also 30 degrees so yeah. That's it, we can see here all the fans, so everything looks pretty good. We can also check here on the um, SATA usually, where is it, SATA configuration, if the hard drive is detected, and here we have my SSD, so this is also working fine. The next thing you should do is set up your boot um, yeah, information, so you can usually um, choose here what kind of device you want to boot, or you just um, hit actually um, F12 on this unit when you start up the PC, and then you can choose from which drive you want to boot. And here my SSD, but if I connect the USB drive, I'll boot from the USB and install the operating system. So that was just a very quick look, and that's the um, Biostar H170T, and as you can see, overclocking seems to be um, disabled, so I can just um, go here through the maximum OC ratio, but yeah, it will still give me just the 3.3 gigahertz. So um, no overclocking guide here on this one, but um, there will be a Hackintosh build, so stay tuned. That was our quick tutorial on how to build a PC. 
I hope I could help you guys. If you have any questions regarding components, regarding some other crap, down below in the comments. Don't forget to like this video if it was helpful and please subscribe that you don't miss any future videos coming on Monday, Wednesday and Friday. So there will be a Hackintosh tutorial um, in the next videos, also some kind of video how to set up your PC and yeah, stay tuned for that. Thank you so much for watching, have a nice day and bye bye, see you soon.